comics, and we are going to be up here using um, the terms comics and graphic novels fairly interchangeably. Uh, comics are a storytelling form. Comics are not a genre. Um, your graphic novel collection is not a genre collection. That is because comics, um, as an art form, are a way of telling stories. They are putting a series of images in sequence that are designed to be looked at in sequence and for the reader to attain a certain meaning. That meaning can be anything. There are beautiful and brilliant works of um, comics biography, philosophy, science, like any topic under the sun you can make a comic about. Um, Similarly, any audience that you might want to write for, you can write a, write a, a comic for them. You can write a comic for two-year-olds. You can write a comic for 20-year-olds. You can write a comic for 200-year-olds. Um, all of the people who come into our libraries might be able to find a comic or a graphic novel that interests them. Um, a graphic novel is a certain type of publication <laughs> that employs comic art. Um, most of the things that we buy for our libraries that we call our graphic novel collection are not technically graphic novels um, because they are reprints of previously published material, whether that be in you know, the sort of standard floppy comic book that we tend to think of when we think of comics, um, or web comics, or strips, or anything like that. So, um, so the language around comics gets kind of messy, and that's OK. And we're going to use all of these terms more or less interchangeably. Uh, none of that super matters. Um, when we think about comics, we, you know, the first thing when I say comic book that's going to pop into your head is probably Superman. And there's a reason for that, which we are going to get into in just a second. Um, but the fact that superheroes are kind of dominant in or have been dominant in comics for a very, very long time is more an accident of history than it is anything else. And if you look at other countries, um, if you look at Japan, if you look at Belgium, if you look at France, um, those are countries who have very rich histories of comics art and who actually celebrate comics art. Um, the, the new president of Japan, um, of, uh, of France, just nominated a graphic novel publisher to be his like minister of culture. Like, can you imagine that happening in the United States? Probably not. Um, but um, so, so the way that we think about comics in this country uh, is actually pretty unique to this country. Amanda's going to tell you why. All right. Hi, everyone. So this is a topic that we could delve really deeply into, but we're going to kind of skim the surface today. In the 1930s and 40s is when comics really started bl blossoming in the United States. Uh, huge readership. It was an enormous industry. Uh, it was impacted positively by World War II. Lots of GIs read comics while they were overseas and then brought them back to the US. It was read by families, women, men, uh, all genres. There was romance, horror. Um, it was just a really dominant, vibrant industry. And then in the early 1950s, a psychiatrist by the name of Frederick Wortham published a book called The Seduction of the Innocent. Have you, any of you heard of this book? Yeah. So it's a very well-known book. And in this book, he connected, he claimed to connect comic readers to juvenile delinquency, homosexuality, uh, petty crime, and all kinds of different ails of the youth. And so this got the attention of the US Senate, and they ran a series of hearings on the connection between comic books and juvenile delinquency. And this was a disaster for the comic book industry. And so the comic book industry banded together and decided to get ahead of it. And they decided to get ahead of it by creating their own self-censoring comics code. And so starting in the early 1950s, every book published had to adhere to the code and be published with this comic seal. And if it wasn't published with the comic seal, it couldn't be sold in stores. It ended up being the single largest self-censorship movement in US history. It was inc incredibly, incredibly restrictive. You couldn't use horror in your title. You couldn't use terror in your title. You couldn't do anything supernatural. Um, all, there was no sets. Everything was very chaste. Uh, forget homosexuality or any queerness. Um, and it just, and crime always had to pay. And the code actually stayed in existence for decades. It didn't end until 2011. So, 
the code directly impacts how the comics industry has panned out since the 1950s. Starting in the 1970s, the code loosened over time. And when we talked about underground comics like R. Crumb and Trina Robbins and others, especially in San Francisco and the Bay Area, we're talking about comics that were published without the seal. That's what made them underground. Not necessarily their content, although their content is what kept them from being published by mainstream media. But that's what created underground comics, and that's what created this publishing industry that really went through an enormous amount of change. And that is how we ended up being dominated by superhero comics because those were the comics that could be published and get around the restrictiveness of the code. It was superhero comics that, that blossomed after the code. It was chased romances like Archie. And it was licensed comics like Disney and Warner Brothers that really flourished for those decades after the code was implemented. Um, and, and ultimately, when um, the Wortham archive was opened up, also in 2011, which just coincided with the the decline of the code, it was found that he faked most of his research. That put hundreds of thousands of people out of, out of business. The only three publishers that survived that were published in the 1930s uh, were Marvel, DC, and Archie. Those are the only three that were publishing pre-code that still exist today. So, why do we collect comics in our libraries? Despite what some parents may tell you and some kids themselves, comics are reading. They create a visual literacy that is very important and essential to many young and aspiring readers, especially uh, we know that for boys and English as second learners, that comics are a gateway to greater reading, much like picture books. And they also circulate. We know that comic books and graphic novels are your DVDs of your, of your print collection. When I worked in Marin County as the teen librarian, I never weeded a book that was on the shelf in the teen graphic novel collection. If it wasn't on the shelf, it was because it was gone. And they all had, they served until they fell apart. And I imagine for those of you who have uh, comic book collections that you're actively maintaining, that's true for you as well. I want to jump in real quick. Yeah. So um, I wanted to say one more thing about visual literacy. Um, what are comics? Comics are combinations of pictures and words that we look at together to form meaning. Um, increasingly, that is also what our information environment looks like, right? Um, with the internet and with kids growing up navigating online spaces, what they're, what they're experiencing largely are combinations of words and pictures that they're putting together, finding the associations between, and, and gaining meaning from. So um, comics and graphic novels, I, instead of you know dissuading kids from um, from reading more deeply or reading prose, um, rather they're reflecting the other kinds of information environments that they're growing up with and interacting with. Um, it's reinforcing the skills that they're exercising in other parts of their research um, or or their information lives, um, and increasingly you know, being able to draw connections between lots of visual information uh, is an important skill for, for people to have. So when we talk about visual literacy, that's one of the main things that we're talking about. And when we talk about, um, when we talk about struggling or struggling readers or English as a second language readers, uh, you know, you have, you have the text in a comic, and then you have a picture that is reinforcing that text. So sometimes there are contextual clues that a reader can glean from the picture that might help them sort out the words. And so that's why when we talk about um, reluctant readers, you know, in addition to them being, you know, having fun content, being about characters that they recognize, um, and being very appealing, you know, there's also that sense of the images are, are building upon or reinforcing uh, the language. Uh, also, when, when you get a comic book, and I can actually say this from experience, you know, I, I collected comics as a teen and then kind of dropped off um, through college. And then when I was in grad school, that was actually when I really started reading comics again. And the reason was because I could quickly read a comic book um, in less time than it would take me to consume a prose novel and get a complete story. So, you know, like I was budgeting my time pretty severely. I didn't have a whole lot of time while I was in grad school, but I could set aside an hour and get a complete reading experience. Um, and being able to sort of quickly digest a story gives readers who might 
who might be struggling that, um, that esteem boost. It lets them feel like they can finish something. And we can, you know, as educators and as people who are concerned about literacy, we can use that feeling of accomplishment and that feeling of esteem to kind of push those kids along, um, you know, and, and expand their reading horizons. Thank you, Jack. So one thing that we talk about a lot is in and shelving and organizing your comments is that we are really not pro 741.5. It when your kids come into the library, or even your adults, they're going to look for your graphic novel or your comic book collection, and they are not going to want to go find 741.5. We all know that Dewey is problematic for the public anyway, but uh, it's we think of it the way you do fiction, right? Fiction technically has a Dewey number, but we don't shelve anything in fiction. In, in fiction under Dewey. We pull it out and we highlight it in other ways. And that's the approach that we want to take and we recommend taking for comic books and graphic novels is to separate them out and put them all together. It doesn't matter what genre they're in. Put them in one space because your readers are going to come in and they're just like your DVD patrons come in and look for things. They're going to want to go to one section and find everything. They're not going to want to have to go to 94.1 to get Art Spiegelman, they're not going to want to go to different areas of the library, put them in one space for them to be able to go and get everything they need. Yeah. And then, and the other, the other strength, I think, of liberating um, graphic novel collections from 741.5 is then you're not, you're not, like when you have nonfiction works, you don't have to catalog them as comics. You can catalog them by their subject content. So you can put science stuff in the 500s. You can put biographies in the 920s. You can, you can let, those, let those books live where, uh, where their subject tells you they want to live and not confine them to a certain you know, genre ghetto because of their form. Um, this is an example of how we manage our spine labels and cataloging at the Berkeley Public Library. So. Um, the first line on that spine label you will see is the audience, so teen, um, no audience label for adults, J for um, juveniles. It's very, very important to have separate graphic novel collections for children's, teens, and adults, just like we have separate prose collections for children's, teens, and adults, because there's some amazing stuff that is being published these days. Um, strictly for an adult audience that you would not want to prevent your adult readers from finding because the only place you buy comics is for the kids section. And Sex Criminals does not belong in the kids section, in case anybody had any question about that. Um, but so we put, we put a GN prefix um, next to, you know, to say that it is part of our graphic novel collection. Uh, and then below that, we have either the Dewey number for its subject, so like in the example of Persepolis, 920, because it's a biography. Um, oh, yeah, Introduction to Climate Change, um, GN 363.7. Isn't that more useful than having inter, inter, uh, Introduction to Climate Change be in 741.5? I think it is. And um, then we put all of our series, um, especially our superhero series, you know, Batman has been published for more than 75 years at this point, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have written Batman. Um, when somebody comes into your library looking for Batman, they don't necessarily want to dig through all of the, you know, every, you know, every, uh, every writer's last name who's ever touched a comic book in their life to find the Batman stuff. They want to just find Batman. That's, all, that's what they care about. Um, so all of the series that we collect that have had multiple writers over the course of its history, we catalog them by their title or by the series title or by the main character. You know, because when you're talking about Batman, you've got Batman, you've got Detective Comics, you've got all of these, um, what, Sirens of Gotham and all of these various things underneath it. We can just call it all Batman, put it all in one place. People that want it will find it. Um, I have started because um, especially superhero series like to stop and start and stop and start over and over and over again. So, you know, you, we have like a hundred Batman volume ones. So um, we, we put the date underneath so that people who are reading their way through a series, you know, that's at least some kind of contextual clue to figure out where that, um, 
you know, that volume three that they need is. It's not the volume three that was published in 1970 because the one I just read was published in 2012. I'm gonna go find the volume three that has 2012 and hopefully that'll get me close to it. Um, and then for series uh, that have only had one author, um, we put, we give those, uh, we, we catalog those under the author's name. So that's um, Margaret Atwood's very, very weird Angel Catbird book. Has anybody seen this? Oh, it's so bizarre. Um, but like uh, the Sandman series, Neil Gaiman was the only person to ever write the Sandman. So Sandman, uh, spine labels say GN, Gaiman, volume whatever, 1986. Uh, was that everything? Yeah, that's everything I wanted to say. Okay. So we have a extensive resource sheet that we're going to send out after the program, but we wanted to highlight a few things that we find particularly useful as librarians and selection. Uh, full disclosure, no flying, no tights. I, uh, I'm an editor for them, but they are one of the few librarian-driven resources. Uh, everybody who reviews for no flying, no tights is a librarian. All the reviewer editors are, are librarians as well. It's run by Robin Brenner of a library on the, in the East Coast. I always think of her as Robin Brenner of No Flying, No Tights. Robin so. Brenner, yeah, that works. And Eva Volan of Alameda City, um, or Alameda Free Library. Yeah. Um, and so it's a really good resource uh, in terms of you're, you're hearing from librarians about what they think about what the assigned age category is and how they feel about whether or not this fits in your library. YALSA, of course, has the um, ALA Media Wars, and they do a graphic novel top 10 list that's invaluable. I've definitely used it to, um, to defend comics that have been challenged. I had to defend Old Van Logan by Mark Millar when I was a teen librarian at Novato, and, um, which is a book that um, can be quite graphic, but it was on the YALSA top 10 list that year, so I was able to justify keeping it in teen for that reason. Um, Voya, when it's not being a dumpster fire. Uh, can also help you keep books in your collection where they belong. I used a Voya review way back when to defend having a Jody Patolt book in the teen section. Um, Image Comics, which is the third largest comics publisher in the US uh, and is all creator-owned comics. They do a librarian's newsletter that could be helpful. Uh, but the thing that I use, and I think Jack uses quite a bit too, is Previews, which is from Diamond um, Distributors who is the comic book distributors uh, in the US, and they send out a monthly newsletter that is completely invaluable. It tells you what the top selling comics are in the US. It has Cat's Corner, which is a long running um, comic by a librarian as well. And it's really an invaluable resource that'll, that has a lot of highlights for you and will let you know really quickly what's really going on in comics today. Yeah, the other... Um the other thing that I noticed that, I, that is worth calling out about um, the Diamond Bookshelf newsletter, especially for educators, um, while I was putting together the resources for this presentation, I, um, I happened to go to their website. Because I get their newsletter every month, but I don't spend a whole lot of time on their website. And their website actually has tons of stuff like um, core collections lists and um, lesson plans for a lot of different graphic novels. So I think it's a it's an even more useful source than, uh, than I originally thought it was. Um, also, um, Image Comics, I think, has been doing sort of the most to specifically brand their newsletters as being for librarians and educators. Um, and you know, in addition to telling you about um, books that they have coming out that they want you to know about because they know that you buy books and they want you to buy their books, um, they're, they're also pulling in other information about comics and libraries. Um, so while they're, well, I think that they might be like at the forefront of um, putting together a specific publication for us. Um, lots of other publishers have regular newsletters that are really valuable. Um, I like the Top Shelf newsletter a lot. Um, and I like the Fanographics newsletter a lot, just for what it's worth. Um, find publishers that you like. Go and see what newsletters they have. Subscribe to them. Yeah. yeah. I would also add that you do not commonly find Diamond and Image at California Library Association and ALA especially at annual, that they're there and there's somebody you can stop and talk to at their booth. And Diamond, of course, is always at San Diego Comic Con. So I wanted to talk a little bit as we move towards the diversity part of our conversation today about what the industry looks like today. And this really informs 
what's kind of being published. This is by, um, oh, I don't have it in my notes. How lovely. Thank you, Lee and Lowe. I was trying to remember what exactly it was called. Oh, there it is, Lee and Lowe. And we linked to this in our resources sheet. Um, they did a widespread evaluation of who it works in publishing from reviewers on up. And no surprise, guess what? Almost everyone who works in publishing is white, able-bodied, cis-identified, hetero-identified, women. From the reviewers on up, it's almost all, 90% or more, that's who's working in comics. And so then when you see... Except the women part. Except for the women part, which, like, hey, look, we're librarians. How many of us are white women that worked in here? So it really informs how the stories that are published, and we know, like in children's books, that most children's books are about white, able-bodied little boys who are identify as straight, cis kids, uh, or talking trucks or animals. That is what the vast majority of children's books are today. So we just wanted to highlight this as far as how it informs publishing today, and also, if you are not somebody who identifies as what the majority of publishing is, I encourage you to become reviewers or become active because we need those voices desperately that are alternative voices to what we see dominating publishing today. And now onto our favorite slide we've ever put up. Um, this is why we need diversity. This is a 2015 book, part of the DC rebirth movement. It's called Voodoo. It is the quintessential example of how the male gaze is used in comics. Notice in the final panel, her bra is hanging off his head. And, and it's also worth mentioning that, um, that the woman dancing in this is actually the main character of the book. And this is the way that you meet this main character in the first issue of her headlining comic. Notice it is not in publication in 2017. I mean, this is, where do you start with the problems with this slide? It's a woman of color, she's being objectified, it's her own book. This guy doesn't matter at all to the sense of the story. And this is modern comics today, and this is why, this is, is this Marvel? It's DC. Oh, it's DC. Uh, which we're going to get into the problems and challenges of both Marvel and DC as they try to navigate a modern world in comics. But so much of comics is based in this problematic area. So we're going to delve into some of that now. Um, one of the reasons why we need to focus on and talk about diversity in comics um, in particular is because they are very, very visual. Um, if you have um, a person who is not uh, a white cis male in a comic, like it's obvious. You can tell who that character is. I know uh, there's, there's lots of studies that readers will, um, readers of prose, if not a lot of information is given about the identities of a certain character, um, readers of prose will sort of fill in the gaps with their own identity to, to make those characters resemble them. Comics, you don't really have that option because it's clear who you're looking at when you're looking at it. Um, Unlike fields like film and television, where the visual nature of um, the storytelling is really important, um, comics tend to be done by very small groups of people. And what that means is there's far fewer, generally far fewer gatekeepers that need to, go, that need to be gone through to convince somebody like, hey, you should have a woman of color in this book. Um, so it makes them, it makes them a... Um, uh, an area and kind of a target, a place that is rife for change and that's, and that's ready for change if the right voices are there getting in there and advocating for that change. Um, I wanted to share, so there's a comics writer named Justin Jordan uh, and uh, I follow him on Facebook and he, he posted this Facebook uh, post a little while ago. He ran an experiment in the scripts of his comics because he, he writes like six or seven monthly comics. Um, so he's working with a wide variety of artists. And he ran this little experiment where he wouldn't assign uh, gender or race information to the characters that he was writing, just to see what would happen. And here's what he said. 
What I found was that white, and often male, is the default for most artists. This is actually true regardless of whether the artist is themselves white or male, which is not hugely surprising in retrospect. It's also true that uh, that artists mostly default to what I guess you'd call stereotypical gender roles. If, for instance, I have a scene that calls for a doctor and two nurses, what I'd usually get is a male doctor and female nurses. Likewise, a call for a soldier almost always gets a dude. As an expansion of that, I recently had a post about a parent and child that didn't reference the gender of either. Pretty much across the board, people left to their own devices defaulted to this being father and son, which, uh, while I wrote the question as non-gender specific, actually referred to a mother and daughter. So male and white is the default for most artists working in America, even if the artists aren't white, male, or American. Um, what, that, what that signifies, I think, is that there needs to be intentionality um, from the top down about who we're writing for, about who we're representing in books. And the thing is, it's actually, you know, unlike, unlike in Hollywood, where that message has to get through, you know, executives and casting directors and, you know, all of these different people, really all you need is an editor or a writer saying, you know, we're going we're gonna to in, in, we're gonna put some diversity in this book. These are the people that we're going to represent in these roles. And once a writer puts that on the page, you know, to be drawn, then an artist sees that and goes, okay, this is what I'm drawing. Um, you know, it's very, very easy for creators to kind of break their default modes if they have the will to do it. Uh, I mentioned, or, um, you know, we've talked a couple of times about the resource guide, and in the resource guide, um, I've, I've pulled out a bunch of articles by Casey Gilley, who is um, my girlfriend, but also is um, a journalist for Comic Book Resources and has done a lot of really exciting uh, journalism about representation, and she did this one article in particular that's that's called out in that resource guide, where she talked to five different creators in kind of a roundtable about um, about representation and about like where barriers to representation are in the comics publishing world. Um, I encourage you to go and seek out um, that link in the resource guide when you get it, because um, it, it explains this whole process really well. I think. So given that, um, given that we have a need for greater diversity in graphic novels, given that uh, we have recognized that creators are very capable of introducing diversity when and if they want to, um, it's now worth looking at what some publishers are actually doing. And we're gonna focus on kind of the big three publishers. Uh, Image Comics is uh, creator-owned and is the third largest publisher of comics in the United States. Um, DC and Marvel kind of vie for, I think DC is, is pretty, uh, pretty solidly the number two publisher and Marvel's the number one publisher. So we're going to talk about them. Um, Image Comics started in 1992 when a bunch of the big name talent at Marvel and DC decided that they were sick of not having any control of, over what they got to write and no ownership of their works after they did it. So they kind of split off and um, formed this new company that was going to be all creator owned. And for a really long time, it was um, basically these creators were just doing knockoffs of the big two superheroes that they, um, that they were writing in the first place. Um, over the course of the last 10 years or so, um, Image's reputation has kind of changed into a place where, um, especially like creators who've already established themselves, have a place where they can bring their audience and tell whatever stories they want. And you can see from, um, from this set of images from their books, um, a lot of the stories that they're choosing to tell are stories about different kinds of people. So um, Monstrous by Marjorie Liu um, features a cast of almost entirely women of color in this um, kind of steampunky fantasy world. Uh, Bitch Planet by Kelly Sue DeConnick um, is sort of a, a women in prison exploitation book that primarily features uh, African American women. And um, Saga by Brian K. Vaughan, which is like one of the biggest comics uh, out there at all right now. Um, one of its, both of its main characters are, um, are also people of color. But by 
freeing up um, these creators who, in large, you know, to, to, to a large extent, have already established themselves and already have an audience, but empowering them to listen to their audience and tell whatever types of stories they want, we're seeing a fair amount more diversity in the books that Image is putting out. And all of these books are very successful. Um, all of the ones that I'm spotlighting right now. I'm not saying all image books are super successful, but, um, you know, and this is happening in an environment with little editorial oversight, um, little, uh, little oversight period. The, the, the creators really are kind of able to, to do whatever they want. And it's nice to see that, that what they tend to do uh, has more diversity than sort of your standard big two fair. So we're going to switch over and talk about DC a little bit. And both DC and Marvel have some problematic approaches to comics that are rooted in their past. What DC does really well is the way that they, the varied ways that they depict sexuality amongst their core characters. Um, Wonder Woman this year, if you know anything about Wonder Woman, it's unquestionable that she's queer. Uh, it's rooted in her origin. But Greg Rekka, while writing Wonder Woman this year, made it canon that she is queer. Um, they also have Apollo and Bindider, which is a gay crime-fighting superhero duo, uh, which is amazing. Uh, they have John Constantine, who is bisexual. Uh, they have Batwoman and um, Maddie Sawyer, who uh, that's where you kind of run into some of their, the problematic internal workings of DC, is that Greg Rekka and J.H. Williams III were going to have Batwoman, Kate Kane, and Maddie Sawyer marry, and then they canceled the book instead of having those couples, that couple get married, claiming that none of their um, superhero couples should be married in the DC universe. So, uh, but Greg Rector did come back and write Wonder Woman, and uh, the current run is astounding. So that's where DC really achieves what they're trying to do in terms of diversity. They also have, um, Jean Yang is writing a Chinese Superman. Is that Keenan Kong? You have the name in the notes. Okay. Yeah, Keenan Kong. Keenan Kong. Uh, so that's been really successful. And of course, Jean Yang is a, a local comic book writer that we all know and adore. Um, so that's where DC is really succeeding. Marvel is not doing so well in terms of how they depict sexuality, but they're doing a really good job in reflecting ethnicity and race. Um, they ha this is Power Man and Iron Fist uh, by David F. Walker and... Sanford Green. Sanford Green, thank you. Um, which is a really great series that uh, is for adults that they're highlighting with Luke Cage. Um, they also have Miles Morales for Superman, or excuse me, for Spider-Man. Uh, in the Ultimate series where he's half black, half Puerto Rican. Um, we're gonna talk about Brian Michael Bendis a little bit, who was created Miles Morales and also Riri Williams as the new Iron Man. Um, we have Ms. Marvel, which if you're not reading Ms. Marvel by J, or excuse me, G. Willow Wilson, I seem to have lost the ability to speak for a moment, um, which is a re recasting of Ms. Marvel, not as a blonde white woman, but instead as a Muslim immigrant teenager, and it's an amazing series. Uh, those are things that Marvel's doing really well. Um, they also have ta Coates doing Black Panther. Uh, they finally hired a black woman to write a comic, uh, and it's Ratsan Gay who is doing World of Wakanda. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff they're doing well there. And one of the series we're most looking forward to that is in um, Seagull Issues right now is America by Gabby Rivera. They have hired, Gabby Rivera wrote um, Juliet Tates a Breath, which is a YA book. Uh, she is a known queer Latina author, and she is writing America Chavez. If you don't know America Chavez, she's amazing. Um, she's queer, uh, she has two moms, uh, she's Latina, and she uh, is finally headlining her own series. This is America here. Um, and so that's just in its like second or third single issue, but when it comes out in trade, that's something you're going to want to check out and get for your audience, because it's not a character that's represented in comics commonly at all. So we want to talk about um, kind of two, two different points here. One of the ways that Marvel has been 
has been ga uh, sort of making strides in the diversity of their casts recently is by recasting a lot of their central characters as different identities. So um, it kind of started when you had Miles Morales um, taking over as Spider-Man. And the way that that all happened is actually pretty great. Um, when they were when they were making a new Spider-Man movie, there was this sort of online um, uh, presence or hubbub around the idea of casting uh, Donald Glover as Spider-Man. And Donald Glover, as you know, is a African-American actor. And um, you had these people online saying like, you know, on the one hand, these people are like, oh yeah, Donald Glover, he's a big Spider-Man fan. He'd be a great Spider-Man, this'd be really cool. And then you had the other people that were like, oh no, he's black, you can't, like Spider-Man can't be black. Like obviously you can't hire Donald Glover because Spider-Man's not black. And Brian Michael Bendis heard all of this and was like, well, why can't Spider-Man be black? And so he actually killed Peter Parker so that he could so that he could bring in Miles Morales. And um, I, I really, I really love this story. I think it's a, it's the the whole sort of death of Peter Parker and then the the reemergence of Miles Morales as, as a superhero. I think is a perfect example of how you can do this sort of story well, because you've got um, this kid who's so inspired by the legacy of this this hero that's gone before him that he really wants to try to live up to that hero's example. And I think it reflects super well a lot of, you know, a lot of the relationships that we um, that we forge with superheroes. That's that's the same way that fans interact with these characters. Um, however, in the in the wake of the success of Miles Morales as a character, um, Marvel went a little rampant recasting its cast. So um, so the next big the next big move they made was introducing a female Thor, where um, yeah, which which I think is actually I think is still a pretty good is a pretty good story, and um, the way that they built the story had this really intriguing mystery around like why is why is this dude not Thor anymore, and why is this woman Thor? So, but then they um, they recast Hulk as um, as a Korean American character, and they recast um, most recently. Iron Man is now a, an African American teenage um, woman, and over time, these these moves start feeling kind of hollow because there's not like on the one hand you're giving different audiences a chance to relate to these characters um, and to really you know actually see themselves uh, in the roles of these characters, but then on the other hand. Um, Every time you do it, it starts feeling more and more and more like a marketing ploy. And if the story isn't behind um, the the recasting of these characters, then 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 it it starts feeling kind of hollow. And then the other the other part of it is, you know, Brian Michael Bendis is um, the guy on the on the right side, um, and he he so far he's the only person that has has gotten a chance to write the Miles Morales. Um, uh, solo book. He's not Miles Morales. And that's not to say he's not doing a great job writing Miles Morales, but it's worth asking, you know, if we gave a black creator a chance to write this black character, what else might they be able to bring to the story? What aspects of Miles's identity could they connect with and could they bring out and, and show to readers um, that maybe Bendis, just because of, because of who he is, um, might not be able to see. Uh, another, another issue um, around, around Mar yeah. I actually, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, I want to go read that now. Thank you, Mimi. Repeat. Huh? Repeat the question. Oh, oh thank, you. thank you. Yeah, she was just pointing out that um, Jason Reynolds has written a novel about Miles Morales as Spider-Man. So that's super cool, and I want to go find that now. Um, you know, uh, 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 and on the issue of um, creators of color getting a chance to work on some of these books, um, Marvel had very, very few uh, creators of color working for them for the longest time. And then a couple of, like a year and a half ago, um, Tana Hussey Coates was announced was gonna come and bring, um, bring Black Panther 
back. Black Panther hadn't had a hadn't had a solo title in a really long time, and Ta-Nehisi Coates, who'd like just won the MacArthur Genius Grant, was going to come in and reintroduce his character, and that's amazing. And the stuff that Coates has been doing with the Black Panther book and a couple of spin-off books off of that has been super super cool. However, it's not like Ta-Nehisi Coates is the only person of color who wants to be writing comics. And the message that that sends, one of the messages that it sends is that you have to be a creator of that caliber in order to get this chance. So it's good stuff, it's bad stuff, there's challenges kind of all around. I think it's worth acknowledging the things that are going really well, calling out the things that are maybe not going as well, and hopefully we will all work towards a perfect and beautiful uh, comics future. Um, and actually, there's a little bit of evidence that that might be happening. So um, the Eisner Awards, if you're not familiar, are kind of like the Oscars of the comic book world. And this is a breakdown of um, just gender representation and who is winning Eisners. So in 2012, um, 18 men or all male teams won Eisners. Four women or mixed gender teams won Eisners. So that's like four books that had a woman working on them at all. Um, 2008, 26 all-male teams and one female or mixed-gender team. Um, 2012, 22 all-male teams and two mixed-gender teams. Um, does anyone want to guess about 2015? Um, hands up if you think the, um, the representation is getting better. Hands up if you think the representation is getting worse. Okay. Many, many people are afraid to put up their hands right now, and that's okay. Um, but in 2012, you actually had like relative parity about, um, about who was winning Eisner Awards, who was getting recognized as making the best books that are out there. And um, the books that are winning are like also really good. And probably you're familiar with some or all of these books. Um, if not, you should be. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not like these are token awards. Um, there's amazing work that is being produced. And um, some of those Eisner winners are going to be up on stage in just a few minutes. So why is this, why is this changing? What are some of the reasons for, um, for the shifts that we are seeing? One of the big reasons is online communities. Um, rather than having, you know, just sort of isolated um, people going to their comic book stores um, where they might be the only person in the store that looks like themselves, um, now people are more and more able to connect in communities online. Um, this photo is a picture of the Valkyries from um, Emerald City Comic Con, I think two years ago. The Valkyries are a network of female comic book store employees um, that have been that have been doing incredible work um, bringing the concerns of sort of non-standard audiences to the forefront of the comic book industry. Um, the Valkyries, uh, it should be noted, have a subs uh, an offshoot called Valhalla. Um, so while the Valkyries are only for um, people who are working in comic book stores, Valhalla are also for um, women who are working in libraries or bookstores or other parts of the publishing industry. I don't get to be in Valhalla, which bums me out because these are like the coolest people in comics right now. But, but, um, <laughs> but um, all of the women in the audience should definitely check out this group and get involved in some of the conversations that they're having. Um, they're, they're, having, they're having a big impact on what is being represented in comic book stores across the country and across the world. Um, they're increasingly a, a, a place that publishers are going to when they're looking for direction about some of these issues of representation that we're talking about. And they have the ear of a lot of creators. Like a lot of creators want kind of like the Valkyrie seal of approval on their books. Um, I also yeah. add that some of these people are also comic book creators themselves, most notably Kate Leth, who is the founder of Valkyries, right? She, yeah. Uh, she just recently did the Patsy Walker series, and she does a whole series. She did Adventure Time. She does a lot of comics. And Debbie Huey, who's local, is also a comics creator, and she's a librarian as well. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different Valkyries and Valhallians who are actively working in the industry outside of just working in the bookshops. 
Uh, another, another place where I think really interesting um, communities are coming up around different identities are um, the black nerd phenomenon. And like there's, there's increasingly large and vocal communities of black nerds or blurds, which is a word that I'm not totally sure how I feel about it, but it's not my word. Um, but we've, called, we've, we've drawn attention to a few um, interesting black nerd blogs um, in the research sheet that we put out, or will be putting out. Another big uh, change in the industry is being brought about by Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is creating an economic platform for creators who might not be able to get publishers' attention, but have built up an audience for themselves um, through web comics or just have a really good idea. And so you're seeing books like um, Erica Moen's uh, Ojoy Sex Toy, like. How many people think that a major publisher is going to, sight unseen, publish uh, a book of comic strips, uh, comic strip reviews of sex toys? Like, probably not very many, but it was a phenomenon on Kickstarter. And based on the success of its Kickstarter, it got picked up for um, distribution by Oni Press. Um, similarly, C. Spike Trotman, who um, maybe her most well-known project has been Smut Peddler, which is um, a collection of pornographic comics, um, primarily by um, queer or non-binary people of color. Um, that's another book that, like, there's not a huge, there's supposedly not a huge audience for, like, you know, lesbian porn comics for lesbians and, and non-binary and non-gender conforming people, but like it found a, a big audience on Kickstarter and um, gave itself, you know, was able to find a lot of success. Um, Moonshot's another example. It was a uh, collection of all indigenous comics. Um, so specifically um, like native creators retelling native stories in modern comics form. So a lot of creators who can't find that success in sort of standard publishing are able to make their works known via Kickstarter. Um, Web comics have also provided a lot of, and been fueling a lot of the change in the comics industry. Um, Noelle Stevenson, who did Nimona. Um, Nimona was originally published as a web comic and built a huge following and then got picked, I can't remember who published it, but it was one of the, one of the big publishers, one of the big book publishers, as opposed to one of the big comics big publishers. Um, and there, there are lots of examples of people who are, who are starting in web comics and finding their voice in web comics, building their audience there, and then taking that to the mainstream. Noelle Stevenson went on to co-create Lumberjanes um, for Boom, which is, uh, you know, another title that's, that represents kind of a shift in what, how we think of, as, how we think of comics now. And finally, um, us, you know, librarians are having, are having a big impact in these conversations. Um, we are looking for books that are speaking to lots of different kinds of audiences and not the standard um, comics reading audience, and publishers know that. Um, a couple of years ago, the uh, yeah, year before last, I was at San Diego Comic Con, and I got pulled into you know half hour, forty five minute conversations with like five different publishers who wanted to pick my brain. Who were like, "How do I reach the librarian audience?" Um, they recognize us as. Uh, as a major factor in their success. They recognize the power that we have to purchase, promote uh, books, and create readers for their books. And they want to give us what we want. And so we have to tell them what we want. Um, that is it. Uh, we have, we can probably take a little bit of time if there are any leftover questions. Yeah. 